And what about you? And in this one, this is a 2 liter TDI diesel common rail. And in this video, we're going to do an oil change. Now, you might think that's a wee bit lame for these type of videos in this channel. But there's a few hints and tips in here. Maybe things you haven't considered. Maybe a wee reminder for the advanced viewers. But uh, some good tips maybe for uh, to think about in this video. So don't turn off just yet. So before we do anything, you want to protect yourself. And this is barrier cream. So the reason why I want to use this is used engine oil is carcinogenic. So you do not really want to get this in under your fingernails and then maybe if you bite your nails or anything like that. So to get it off, it gets into the pores of your skin. You don't want to get used engine oil into your skin or into your eyes or anything like that. And we're going to put these gloves on as well. I can get them on with the barrier cream on. A wee bit sticky. So, protect yourself. Because nobody else will. So this car is just in, uh, in the garage. It's on my ramp. And uh, it's up to temperature. So you want the engine to be, to have a bit of temperature on it. It doesn't have to be fully up to temperature, but you want a bit of temperature on it uh, to get the oil to flow. So it's my habit, first of all, this car, this engine has a dipstick. A lot of engines do not these days, BMWs and the like. Some Audi engines don't either. Engines very like this one, is to check the dip, just to see if uh, your oil levels are correct. If you're servicing the car yourself, or you're getting serviced by somebody else on a regular basis, you want to see if the car is using oil or if it's been running low on oil or anything like that. So it gives an indication that, you know, maybe there's a leak and you'll, you'll, you'll have a wee look on your inspection later on when we get up in the air and we're underneath the car. So we're going to dip this and this is not too bad there. Just shy of the, shy off the full there so there's a wee bit used uh, i've no idea when the last one last time this was serviced and i don't know this isn't my car i don't know why the guy that owns it has been topping it up he certainly didn't mention that but it gives you an idea now on some cars on some cars if you pull the dipstick out mendeos do this and some of the toyotas and uh, a few others anyway if you pull that dipstick out right away you mightn't see any oil on it at all and the reason for that is the way that the outer pipe goes straight into the sump so I'll just uh, show you a wee demonstration of that so if you imagine this bit of pipe represents the dip, the dip stick tube that goes down into the sump on some cars not the case in this one and some cars this will be in the oil so the level of the engine oil is say uh, there on the outside of the dipstick tube so whenever the dipstick is down in the tube it actually doesn't protrude and it doesn't sit in the oil so it's actually sitting there but the oil is at this level so the oil because it's sealed at the top there uh, the oil isn't up the tube so if you pull the dipstick out and it's completely dry what you have to do is allow the oil to come back up into into the pipe to get a reading on your dipstick. So when you pull the oil out, and I've heard this, people doing this on Mondeo, so they didn't realise this. When they pull the dipstick out, it's completely dry of oil. There's no oil on it at all. And uh, what you have to do is give it uh, a wee while, 30 seconds or something like that, just to let the, the oil travel up, because now you've opened the end of it. The, the end is no longer sealed. So the, the level that you're taking is what, what is in the tube. And we can demonstrate that effect uh, dead easy. So what's going on there is a bit like this. Here's a sink full of water. And we get a paint glass. And we dunk her down in. And the water doesn't go into the glass. So that's trapping the air inside it. Because the end of it's sealed. So if we 
release this end here, that water will go up into the glass. So this car has another tray and uh, with the under tray removed, I'm not going to show you how to do that because uh, all cars are different in that respect but uh, in this car the engine sits right at the front and there is our sump on but while we're under there we want to check for leaks, any leaks out of that oil sensor there, uh, drive shaft boots, uh, just have a wee look under the engine, any split hoses, that's the intercooler up there and what we're going to do we're going to take that hose off there as well so we're going to drain the intercooler see if there's any oil in it uh, there's a drive shaft bit there and the metal uh, boost pipe that goes across any signs of oil coming out any signs it's starting to rust through a wee bit there Let's see if that hose is in good condition so it all looks pretty good there's no real leaks that I can see, uh, but uh, the oil level was good in this car, so I didn't expect to see anything really bad. Okay, so we're going to pull this sump on, and so we have our gloves on. We're going to crack this and wind it out a wee bit, and it should come out with your fingers. And what you want to do is you see that wee washer. Make sure that wee washer is attached to the nut. Is when you pull this off it'll just drop into your bucket so obviously we've got a bucket beneath us here and uh, my hand's probably in the way there guys but all I'm doing is screwing this out and with my fingertips I'm just holding the washer back I have a bucket pretty up close to it and I'm holding the bung sort of in to stop the flow to stop this here from going all over the place I'm just going to lower the bucket down so that's what the gloves are for uh, it's pretty warm, not too bad, and we'll just let that go. So cars with a lot of oil in them, it'll just fly out if you just release that. And that is brave and watery. So, okay, I'm happy enough just to take that. And then we need to move our, whatever your, uh, in this case it's just an ordinary bucket. You need to move that across as the, the flow uh, calms down and then it'll just fall down straight. So there are buckets still beneath and the sump on drained. This, this one here is a 32mm socket so uh, we got a 32mm socket on there. Get that off. Here we go. Sometimes these can take a wee bit of it. There we go. So I've just moved it back down under the car. And whenever we take this oil filter off, whenever we release it, you'll see what happens here in a second. So, what will happen is we'll release an anti drain back valve that's in the uh, housing, and that'll release the oil that's in the oil filter housing, and that'll come out the sump. So, whenever we lift it off, hopefully, that's a another wee drip. So before we take the oil filter completely out we'll uh, just leave it in there for a second and just let that drip away. Okay so with the oil filter out, uh, it's a simple case of giving this a good grip on it, your hands with your gloves on and give it a good pull off. Sometimes these can stick on pretty badly. Thing to note with this one, so we're watching what we're doing, is this can go on the wrong way so if we look at the inside there and the inside there, they are different depending on what side. Um, we can see right in here. So that is a mal filter. Uh, OX308 made in Austria. And it even says they're top. So that sits in. That sits in like that. So that's the mal uh, OX308 and with the word top on it. Not all filters will say that, not all filters will do that, but you just need to keep an eye on your orientation when you take it out. So that's that. Now, so I'm just going to set that on that for a second. And we have the exact same filter here. Uh, so OX the idiot D there. So we'll pull that out. This is, this is what I like to do anyway. So we'll pull that out. 
Take our filter out, try not to grab the, the paper element and we'll simply stick that in the box there so the box will uh, absorb some of the oil there. So with our little pick tool that we used before we're going to get rid of these seals and we'll just pull them off and they go into the discarded box there. So it's a small one, that one, and then there's the big seal here on the housing itself. And we'll just shove that in the box as well. So try to keep the place clean and uh, have our egg to the side here just to clean up my gloves. So we got uh, our new seals. And this is pretty self-explanatory, but uh, I'll keep filming anyway, just so that you you know that I've done it. So if you notice the, the bigger groove there on the housing, and we'll just pull it over with our fingers. There we go, and roll it, roll it down into there. Larger of the two seals, we'll just roll her down with your fingers onto there, that's dead on sometimes these can be a wee bit tight, this top one might be a wee bit tight just because they're new and uh, might need a wee bit of help with our pick tool just to guide her, guide her on like that so that's perfect just going to give my gloves a wee bit of a wipe and we can see our orientation there's the right knot, so that goes top so that's going to go down down, down the way. Uh, okay, so just keep an eye on the orientation. Some of these filters, they, some of the, some of them are exactly the same. And you just press that down, and that will spin whenever we take it down. In. So that's that bit. So before we're going to wrap this up, I like to put a wee bit of oil around this seal here. So the thing has a lot of oil on it. So we we'll just spin that around the hand and give it a quick squirt, just to make sure it's completely wet. So we're going to offer a filter in, it's quite an easy one, easy access one this, and just offer in. Uh, now, you want to start this just with your hand, uh, you'll get a couple of threads on it, just by hand, and you feel it starting to tighten up a wee bit. And we get our thirty-two mil. Now, just I was going to note here, I have this on a wobble joint, so that will wobble about a wee bit. Sometimes, uh, this one here isn't too bad, you could probably get away with a straight extension, but this one here will give me a wee bit of movement on it. So, it's so I know that it's going to sit on the, the top of the housing. Um, any resistance here at all, so you can feel it, that's it down to the rubber seal, and you can feel it. Just by feel and down. You don't need to swing on this. Uh, a lot of these Volkswagens, you can actually bust this plastic out. Uh, you can crack it. And you may not know it that, you, that you've done that. And uh, you get a, a huge oil leak from the housing. So I've heard of guys doing that, so you just be conscious of that. So. Tight's tight, it's supposed to be 25 newton meters in that, but uh, because it's going to have a seal, uh, that can be a wee bit misleading. But uh, you need to feel it, feel the, the ratchet whenever you're you're putting it in. And uh, any resistance, uh, you know that you're either cross-threaded or there's something, something wrong. Maybe you have the wrong filter, the filter's too long or something, and it's uh, not going to go in correctly. So we're just going to give consideration to the to the bung here. Uh, so I've cleaned the bung a wee bit up, and one thing you want to look out for is if there's any aluminium uh, swarf. This is a steel bung and then aluminium sump, and if it didn't come out by hand, you may suspect that it has been cross threaded by somebody before, which is a result of over tightening. People over tighten these. The torque of these is pretty crucial, and they don't need to be that tight. So this particular one here has a steel washer on it. It has not got a crush washer. 
Right? I could take that off. I could spin that off. It is, it is on quite tight. I don't know. It's, it's probably not worth the hassle of taking this particular one off because it wasn't leaking. And it's a steel washer. It's not a copper crush washer. However, we have a few copper crush washers here. If you get, uh, if you have a sump bung and it has a copper crush washer, uh, like me, I have uh, trays of these things, but you can reuse them. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. So your copper washer, uh, whenever it's crushed, gets flattened. And what that does in copper is it squeezes all the atoms together and it actually makes it very hard and actually very brittle. So if you get a bit of copper bar, quite a thin bit of copper bar, and you bend it back and forth lots and lots of times, it will actually fracture, it'll go hard and actually snap on you. So that's uh, why everybody says, well, you need to, cha you need to change the copper washer for a fresh one. But if you don't have a fresh one, and uh, one doesn't come with the oil filter, which nowadays they very, very rarely do, what you can do is you can actually resurrect this. So this is annealing, and uh, if you haven't got a propane torch, you can just do this in the gas cooker. So we'll give this a wee minute or two and see what happens. Of course, you need to use pliers, you know, if you're not confident, wear gloves, uh, oven gloves even, or something like that. And uh, you're doing this at your own risk, of course, and at the risk of messing up your kitchen. So if you have uh, a house proud person living in the house, uh, they mightn't be too keen on you doing this. But what I want to do is get that cherry red. Now, because I'm holding it with the pliers here, I'm going to heat up the tip of the pliers as well. So we can see that starting to go cherry red there. So what I'm going to do is actually move around and grab it in an hour position. So it goes quite black when you do this. And what some people do is they would quench this. Now you can't do that. Do not do that with steel. If you are holding these with pliers, don't put the tip of those pliers in the water because it'll make that tip go brittle and you'll effectively ruin your pliers. So whenever that goes cherry red, that's it annealed and just let it cool down by itself. This is pretty crucial now. Uh, as I said, this sump bolt is M14. Now it's quite big, M14 with a 19 mil head. So it's quite large, so uh, it's a steel bolt going into an aluminium sump. So the torque on this is quite crucial. So it's one of the things that I actually torque with a torque wrench. Um, there are few torque, a few torques in cars that I do use a torque wrench for. And if we look at the, the data here, sump drain bolt, let's bring it to focus, sump, sump drain bolt, 30 newton meters. Now, if it's smaller than that, if it's an AM12, AM10, something like that, 25, even 20 newton meters, it isn't that much. So, yeah. Um, and if we look, there's the oil filter there at the bottom. I'll get you into that. Oil filter is 25. And that's the one for this car, which is a Seat Axio CAGC 2 liter TDI common rail engine. And, uh, yeah, so we'll set up the torque wrench, 30 newton meters. So back onto the car, we'll give that a wee wipe there. It'll still drop a wee bit, but that's okay. And uh, we'll offer some bung up, some bung up. And you want that, hopefully, to screw in by hand, so you know the threads are good in that sump. So, unless somebody's got out for it and they've over-tightened it, that could give you trouble. There's some cars, the threads are very, very weak. Uh, Reynolds, Hondas, stuff like that. So we'll have our torque wrench at 30, and we're gonna. So it's just taking it up, and then just that wee bit there. It's not that tight. Now, that being the larger of the sump bungs, uh, it's, as I said, it's usually about 25, or even a wee bit less. Right, so now that's, that, that's on, uh, we'll get the bucket out of the way. And we'll give that a bit of a clean up. Doesn't take much, just a just a wee wipe, just to clean her up. Clean her off a wee bit. So uh we'll get the undertray back on, get the car back down the deck. 
So before we're going to put the under tray on, I nearly forgot there, I said it right at the start. We're going to pull this intercooler hose off here. And uh, there's a couple of 7 mils on the JB clip. And we're going to see if there's any oil in it. And do we drain so if we base and blow us in here. Give that a good idea. Pull on a wheel. Let's see if there's anything in it. So there is a wee bit. Let's see if we can get that off. There, so. Let's stay on. There's some like eyes drill a wee hole in these to try and uh, evacuate it as much as they can. Uh, so I don't do that. I just uh, pull the hose and give it a bit of a clean out with a rag. So we're ready for the engine oil and what we want to find out is tape and quantity. So the tape is very important. So I've typed in the Google there, Google, just a Google search there. Coma oil, C-O-M-M-A, C-O-M-M-A. And this is a UK brand. It's a, a trade brand, but it's made by Mobile as far as I know. So I'll click on that, click on their website there. And it comes up uh, with the home page there. So we're gonna look up product lookup now. It may ask you to register and all that for this, but you don't have to. So click on find, find products and it'll ask for the vehicle registration, UK or Republic of Ireland. I'll just zoom you in a wee bit. United Kingdom or Republic of Ireland. So I'm going to type this reg in with this guy's car, so I hope he doesn't mind. Uh, so it's D K one two. products so it's asking me to join there but we'll just put remind me later uh, you can you can register and log in it's all free so this car is said axio um, this is a 2012 so we'll click on that one and there we go Engine, to give, it tells us the engine code, and sometimes it doesn't tell you the engine code, but or it gives you a choice of engine codes, and 4.3 litres, and that's the, the type of oil there. So an important bit here is fully synthetic, high performance, 5W30, low saps oil. That's very important. If your car has a DPF, you need to use low saps oil. So what is that? I'll just show you. Maybe a wee bit blurry, but this is what it says in the on the bottle here. Fully synthetic 5W30 low saps oil for modern petrol and diesel vehicles fitted with exhaust after treatment units that require an ACEA C3 grade. So let's zoom you out at least a wee bit. This is what I'm using here. And I buy that by the 20 litres, as you can see. So this SAPS, this S-A-P-S thing, uh, what that stands for is sulfated, sulfated ash, phosphorus and sulfur. So there's uh, a low amount of uh, ash going to come off this engine oil. So that uh, prevents blockage of your DPF. So that's what you, if you have a DPF or any exhaust after treatment unit, uh, that's uh, what you want to use. If you don't use that, you, can, you run the risk of blocking your DPF prematurely. So the oil we want to put in this car is a C3 grade. Now, what, what does all that mean? So everybody knows the, the 5W30 there. That's just a temperature range. But down here, if you look, there's ACEA, A3, B4, and API SLCF. So that's the actual blend of this fully synthetic oil. Fully synthetic oil is a blend of oils and it contains detergents and all sorts of other stuff. But uh, I'm not going to go into that. I don't really know what exactly what's in it. But um, okay, ACEA is uh, it's French. It's the Association de Constructeurs Européen d'Automobile, or quite simply European Automobile Manufacturers Association. So this is this E. If you remember, this E is the European grade. This car here that we have behind us is calling for a C3. European grade. Now the API for the Americans that are watching perhaps is the American Petroleum Institute and their grading is these two SLCF there. So uh, so that's the European grade and that's the American grade. 
So that's the difference in these oils. So I'm quite lucky in this one, I can get a quite a big funnel into it. So obviously you need to have the funnel nice and cleaned out. I have to dispense five liters in a normal type five liter container. So I'm gonna throw four liters of this in here. And because it's a quite big funnel, I'm gonna do this quite quickly. Sometimes you need a very small funnel and you just have to take your time. Um, so 4.3 liters is the capacity according to our comma website website um so i'm gonna throw just slightly over four liters out uh, on cars with the exhaust after treatment units the dps and stuff you do not want to overfill so you don't want to put too much in it uh slight overfills probably all right like but uh you don't want to go mad with it so I've put in, you probably can't see that, but that's four liters. And I'm gonna put, just guess another e bit there. And that sits in there all right. So we're just over four liters in, funnel out. Let's just put that in a bit of a rag there. I'm always gonna drip an oil cap on, make sure the oil cap is on correctly. Dipstick is in, make sure the dipstick's in. And of course, just uh, remember yourself that uh, your sump plugs in. If you forgot to put your sump plug in, uh, you'd be there'd be a lot of oil up your feet. So now we're gonna start the car. So we'll start the car with the car running, and uh, that's to get the oil into the into the round the oil filter again. And uh, so we'll get a proper level uh, after we've let the car idle for just a couple of minutes. So after the car's run, it's a good idea just to pull the dipstick and uh, just to release the, the seal. Now that, if you suspect your cars was one of those ones where we described the wee tube, that lets the oil come back up the tube so you get a proper reading. Um, some, I forgot to mention earlier on, some cars in the tube that, that is sitting in the oil, there would be a hole in it, they allow that to come up. So if you see a dipstick tube that it, that it is, if you take a sump off that it is in it, there may be a wee hole in it, and that's to allow the, the oil to go back up in. But I'm in the habit of, no matter what, just pull the dipstick tube and that lets the, the oil come up. So we'll pull the dipstick out and give it a clean, have a, a rag handy if you want it dripping all over the engine. And uh, nice and clean. Now in a diesel, it'll be black uh, diesel oil because of the high compression and the blow by on the pistons, it makes the diesel oil black. So don't expect this to be nice and fresh. So we need a wee bit more there, uh, so um, we'll put a wee, a wee taste in. But it takes very little oil to go up the up this uh, up this uh, measurement on the dipstick tube or in the dipstick itself. So don't be putting another liter in if you see it just at three quarters. So when you do top up, uh, it doesn't take that much to bring it up, but uh, you want to be patient. Uh, so you need to wait about 10 minutes for all the oil to drop down back into the sump again. And uh, what you also want to do is, sometimes if you put the dipstick in and pull it out too quickly, there's oil in the dipstick tube. So it can, you know, you see oil just messed up on the whole, on the whole dipstick itself. So you need to give it a couple of, uh, seconds 10 seconds 20 seconds let anything fall back down the dipstick tube itself so in this particular one it's clipped in so it needs to be rightly home to get a proper reading and uh, we'll pull it back out and that's it filled up so right up to the top so i'm happy enough for that took just over uh 4.3 liters in this case and uh it's probably the the quantity that the filter housing has has taken because we drained the filter housing out with uh, the way we did it earlier on. So there we go. Uh, I'm just gonna top up the power steering fluid, top up the coolant in this, change the air filter, um, reset the service light, do a quick scan on it, see if there are any issues with it. And that's that for this one. So hopefully there may be a few wee hints and tips in that. I know it seems a wee bit mundane how to change the engine oil, but uh, a wee bit of oil types, a wee bit of uh, different things there so hopefully maybe you get something out of it maybe not but uh, everybody has their own wee ways of doing it 
that's the way I do it anyway. I think that's, uh, I'm in the habit of doing that. That's the exact procedure I do with every car. So many thanks for watching. Uh, all the best and bye bye.